<laughs> I don't really like mics. I'd rather just yell. <clears throat> That'll work. So we're going to go ahead and start. Sorry about uh, the technical issues here. We're trying to figure it out. We'll try to figure out. Bear with us. We'll try to figure out as, uh, can you guys hear me all right? Okay, cool. Uh, we'll try to figure out as we go along. Um, it just happens sometimes. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for coming out. There's a lot of work that's been put into this since uh, June. Um, thank you to the panelists for showing up and uh, being part of this. And thanks to the Friends of Fission. My name is Justin Collins. Um, I'm the president of the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management, a student chapter here on campus. Um, <clears throat> our goal, our mission, is the safe, secure, and effective stewardship of nuclear materials and related technologies. Um, for the students in the crowd, if you're interested, uh, we have in our chapter, we have more information sheets outside. Uh, we have, you can be part of events like this, planning events, fundraisers. Uh, we facilitate research to try to get you um, the opportunity to go present your research at the annual conference uh, during the summertime. Um, our other host I've already mentioned is the Seattle Friends of Fission. Uh, they're an activist group uh, that promote the um, clean energy of nuclear power. Um, and then we also have uh, John Dobkin, uh, sorry, it's Paula and, and Brian with Friends of Fission right there. And then John Dobkin with Energy Northwest. So uh, it's been a team effort. Um, this is how the program is going to work. Uh, Eric is going to, I'll introduce Eric in a minute with his bio. Uh, he's going to sing a song and then after, <laughs> yeah, he's going to sing a song. Uh, and then after Eric, uh, Nick, Dr. Nick Torn is going to be our moderator. He's going to introduce the panelists. The panelists will give a short intro themselves uh, and then they will move forward uh, with the questions. Um, please hold all your questions uh, till the end. Uh, we will stop or we'll transition promptly at 745 and then open the floor up to questions from that time period. Uh, so with that, I'm going to transition to Eric. And Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Okay, great. All right. All right. It's better if you introduce yourself, right? All right. There you go. All right. Thanks a lot, Justin. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Full room here. Um, my name is Eric Meyer. I thought I was going to be a professional opera singer, and then I saw a video about an advanced nuclear reactor, uh, one of which actually that, that uh, Nick, Nick's company is working on, a molten salt reactor, and that changed everything for me. I, I knew from then on I'd have to be a nuclear advocate. <laughs> so fast forward a few years down the road, I uh, started an organization called Generation Atomic. Uh, we're almost a year old. We, we uh, have an app called Atomic Action that lets you contact your senators and uh, make, make a positive change for nuclear. Um, and we're going to the climate talks tomorrow where I'm going to be singing the following song as well as some others and uh, generally just causing a ruckus for, for nuclear there uh, because it's the elephant in every room. <laughs> um, so without any further ado, that was probably plenty already. <laughs> uh, uh, here's, uh, here's the fossil fuel serenade, and I am playing a character in this. Um, the, you'll see if you can find it, figure out who it is. <laughs> see if this works. I'll just hold the mic to it. Yeah. Yeah, that's just not, totally not happening. Okay, so the sound, it looks like the sound is not turned on. Okay. We got a, ooh, okay, that's just not, that's just not happening. Is it, okay, is there, we have a sound guy too, and I, okay. All right, well that was a nice intro for <laughs> nothing. So we're, we're plugged into the, the headphone jack, can you turn that up? Oh, you know what, it might be right here. Try that. She's playing. No, okay. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for taking the time out of your evening to come hear about this topic. Uh, so, 
1895, a German guy named Wilhelm Rankin was messing around with some high voltage and photographic plates and a vacuum pump, and he discovered x-rays. Uh, and the x-ray physics mania that took off after that quickly led to someone named Marie Curie discovering a natural source of these things that look like x-rays. Uh, and she called the, she gave a name to that kind of material, she called it radioactive. And that was the start of really the nuclear age. Uh, it took about 40 years until 1938 uh, for nuclear fission to be discovered, which Lisa Meitner was the first to correctly interpret as the splitting of the atom. And this was kind of, times were rough in Europe, and it was only four more years, uh, 1942, Enrico Fermi, a recent immigrant, uh, created the first man-made nuclear chain reaction in a squash court under, a, under the stadium at University of Chicago. This began in earnest the Manhattan Project, and they built huge cities and spent billions of dollars in just under three years. Uh, and the conclusion of that was the, uh, sorry, the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki then brought us violently and tragically into the age of nuclear weapons. But, so let's rewind a little bit. There was this nuclear reactor in 1942, and it took the Manhattan Project to, to weaponize the chain reaction. But it turns out uh, that the non-weaponized chain reaction can do a lot of interesting things. You can make electricity, you can explore space, you can help fight cancer, you can propel ships, uh, and lots of other things. And today, indeed, we have a fleet of these things uh, operating large-scale uh, electricity generators 24-7, uh, making electricity around the world. Sorry. Uh, the fuel for these things is so energy dense that a soda can of it can contain the, enough energy that, to power your entire life, all of your gas, all of your oil, for your whole lifetime fits in a soda can. And that's this astounding energy density. It's very interesting. Uh, but as you know, things aren't all fine and dandy in the nuclear industry right now. It's unpopular. Uh, there's a lot of reactors being built in China right now, but there are also reactors being shut down prematurely elsewhere. Uh, Westinghouse recently went bankrupt due to cost overruns uh, on new builds in the American South. There's a long-standing anti-nuclear movement that is absolutely pervasive in popular culture. Do we have any members of the anti-nuclear community here? <laughs> o old members? That's fine. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, but there's a bigger movement out there now that we're all on. Um, the guy on one of the boards back there, there's a picture of a guy named James Hansen, who's a NASA scientist who in 1988 was the first to testify to Congress that the amount of greenhouse gas <coughs> emitting into the atmosphere is going to cause serious climate change. 30 years later, after more careful analysis, uh, measurements and analysis, uh, the world has decided to decarbonize overall. And we're working on it. The, inter the intermittent renewables, wind and solar, are honestly doing really well. Uh, capacity is way up, prices down, popularity and political support is almost 100%. Um, but as you know, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and the sun doesn't always shine. So as a result, natural gas plants are being built alongside the renewables, and uh, natural gas is a fossil fuel. As it turns out, uh, we simply will not succeed in decarbonizing if we depend as heavily as we are on a fossil fuel, even with an incredible growth in renewables. So here sits nuclear, running along 24-7, rain or shine, polar vortex or not. It's carbon-free, and it has a very small footprint. So we have enough fuel to run it effectively forever. And anyway, so it's interesting. We know it works. We know we can build it rapidly and at scale, as they did in France when they electrified their whole grid in under 10 years. So it can be done. So anyway, what's up with all that? Tonight we're going to explore this issue, and I hope you'll leave with a better understanding of the energy source and how it relates to climate change. My name is Nick Turan. I'm a, uh, I'm a millennial who chose to become a nuclear engineer specifically to fight climate change. Uh, that's kind of a new breed of nuclear engineers. 
although I'm just barely a millennial, I guess. Uh, I work at a company over in Bellevue called TerraPower. It's an advanced reactor design company started by Bill Gates and Nathan Mirvold with the goal of bringing advanced nuclear to help with the climate change issue and other energy issues. Uh, I'll be your moderator tonight. I'll be asking the panel lots of questions to discuss this, and then you'll get to ask questions. So with that, let's get this show on the road, and uh, if the panel can just briefly introduce themselves. I'm sorry about the AV outage, but uh, let's start with Lenka. Who are you? Uh, where do you come from? Why are you here? It's on. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lenka Kolar, and uh, Nick asked me to talk a little bit about my own nuclear history. Um, it started a while ago, actually, when I was really young. Uh, my parents and I well, I didn't decide. My parents decided to become refugees and move us from the Soviet Union uh, to the U.S. And I, growing up here, I was always in between two different cultures. Um, my parents being from Slovakia and Eastern Europe, a very kind of cynical, questioning culture, um, tend to be really negative. And this American culture, which you have a lot of people that are very entrepreneurial and positive, and it's just a much more positive thinking culture. So I was always bridging these two sides. And um, fast forward to when I decided to become an engineer, I went to Purdue University. And I didn't want to do something that everyone else was doing. So being a woman in engineering was my first uh, kind of act of defiance. And then uh, I took a seminar from the nuclear engineering department. I had heard of nuclear energy before. My dad back in Slovakia had actually worked in city planning and there was a power plant right outside of the town where we're from, and he actually worked on the project to bring excess heat from the power plant into the city during the winter to heat the buildings. So it's a very efficient process and not something that you see done here in the US. And he always told me to not believe in the environmentalists um, in the US because they were anti-technology. Um, so being a questioning person, I questioned my dad on this as well, um, saying that, well, maybe the nuclear industry in the past didn't act that great either to make the environmentalists um, not like them. So, so I thought, you know, there were these two tribes that were formed back in the past. And then I think when you see younger engineers going into the field today, much as Nick and I, um, we went into nuclear engineering to want to do something good for the environment. Um, and I grew up as an environmentalist. We have solar panels on our house at home. Um, I was the first person uh, that I knew to have a hybrid car because it was my first car when I was 16. So grew up with this environmentalist mentality. Um, and I didn't really understand why environmentalists wouldn't like nuclear energy for our, all of its attributes. Um, so when I took that nuclear engineering seminar freshman year, I wasn't I was inspired by the, the potential for nuclear energy, but also the potential for the other things you can use nuclear technology for, including medical imaging and space exploration. Um, and I really wanted to uh, help um, to further this field and tell people about it. And what I figured out throughout school was that we were actually really good at the engineering and the technology part, um, but pretty bad at telling people about it, um, involving communities, listening to people, and getting the right policies through to advance the nuclear um, technology industry. So again, I started to see my role in bridging another gap, which was that in between the communication of nuclear technology um, to environmentalists, to policymakers, to people that uh, care about these global issues that we're dealing with now. Um, so now I work for New Scale Power, um, where a company based in Oregon started out of Oregon State University as a Department of Energy uh, project to create a small modular reactor, which I will describe what that is a little bit later in the panel. Um, and now I work on strategy and external relations. So I'm really bridging that gap between the technology and the policy side, the environmental side. Um, and that's where I've really found my niche. So, thank Thanks. Mark. Yeah, so I'm Mark Shanfine. I've uh, been here before, really enjoy coming to the campus. Uh, the fact that I'm here really is based on a chance encounter. It happened almost 40 years ago. Uh, I had started with the Atomic Energy Commission actually working on the Fast Flux test facility, which is no longer operational. But um, I heard that there was somebody I knew who was going to go work in Europe. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I'll go talk to him. And so I talked to him. And for the first time in my life, I hear about the International Atomic Energy Agency. 
and he's going to go there to be a safeguards inspector. And then the most important thing he said to me, and you have the right qualifications. And that was it. So I applied, and I basically have, have never looked back. So I really focus on nonproliferation, international safeguards, uh, trying to keep, uh, you know, nuclear material uh, in a transparent way uh, for peaceful uses. Uh, so I worked at the IEA for about four years as an inspector. I then came back. I also had a, a great opportunity to work at Los Alamos National Lab in their plutonium facility for the weapons program. So that gives you really good insight into what does it mean to have a facility like that that's trying to design weapons components using plutonium. I then went back to the IEA to run what they call their unattended monitoring systems unit. That one was kind of the, the modern um, transition to safeguards where uh, now as technology got better and better, you could begin to install it in the facility and basically monitor the nuclear materials in a much more effective way than having a person periodically go in and look at the materials. So I did that for about another four years. Uh, I've kind of bounced around to different national labs, uh, but when you're in this field, um, and I never planned my career out, I always kind of jumped at the next shiny object that I saw, and I was lucky, so it worked out. Uh, but also sometimes unusual things happen that you can't plan and ever think are going to happen. And one example for me uh, is I became part of the technical team that went into North Korea under the Bush administration for uh, trying to uh, basically slow down their program and hopefully even disassemble it. And of course, you all know that didn't work out very well if you follow the news. Uh, other people who I work with went to, to Libya to pull out all the gas centrifuge enrichment equipment that they had purchased from AQCON. So those kind of things happen, and you never know when they're going to happen. But of course, they're pretty fascinating. I feel fortunate to be part of that. Um, and so really, my focus is to try to um, improve international safeguards in particular for the International Atomic Energy Agency so they're as effective and as efficient as they can be. And we'll talk some more about that as we go through the, the evening. Thanks. Jim Conker, I started out as an extraterrestrial biologist, actually. It's kind of bizarre. And worked for, for NASA um, and talk about unexpected events. The Challenger blew up, and I was coordinator of shuttle activities over the poles. And a lot of us youngins then were kind of thrown into or thrown out of the, of the program and I ended up in nuclear, which is kind of bizarre. Um, but the planetary aspect of it gives you a great global feel. And so we started working on, on uh, global warming a long time ago. But this is not new. We've known global warming for, for ages. Um, in fact, it's been going on for five uh, for four billion years, so this is nothing new. Um, and then uh, then I, I got into being a geologist, a planetary geologist. I got into nuclear waste disposal because nuclear waste disposal is all about the rock. It's geology. Deep geologic disposal is all about the rock. If you pick the wrong rock, it's not very good. If you pick the right rock, it's great. So, um, so I've been working on that for a long time, uh, along with other issues like acid mine drainage cleanup and things like that. Um, so, and so, so I'll end up talking about nu nu nuclear waste. It's actually a piece of cake. We know exactly what to do with it. It's not difficult. We're just not allowed to do it uh, correctly for politics, and that's where a lot of this discussion is going to go. Politics intrudes itself into science a lot, and we end up not doing the right things that we're, we should be doing uh, because of that. Thanks. All right. Well, Jim, I'm going to give you the first question, since you have the planetary yes. review, which is, what are our planet's future energy needs? We, we need about, um, I, I'm not sure if you can pick up, bring up slide one. We don't have slides? Okay, that's fine. Um, we need, right now, the, we produce 20 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity a year as, as a species. Okay, so 20 trillion kilowatt hours, great round number. The United States produces 4 trillion of that. So we produce a fifth of the world's energy, and, and we, we only have a 5% a of the world's, um, of, of the world's people. So, so we produce a lot of energy. 20 trillion sounds like a lot, it is, but you need about 35 trillion in order to eradicate global poverty. So the only way to eradicate global poverty is to give everyone on Earth about 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. That's the only way to do it. Okay, you, you can talk about anything else you want, but it doesn't matter. You need to give everyone 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. Because a lot of the people in extreme poverty right now spend about six hours a day getting water. If you spend six hours a day getting water, and you have a little pump, a little electricity, you have a, a pipe, wow, it, it frees you up for amazing things. Uh, and with that, with, with increased energy comes, comes decreased um, f f fertility. You know, the fertility rate drops 
to below two when you have about 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year in, in, in your society. So the big question, all COP21 uh, climate meeting in Paris was about was how to give everyone 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year without giving them coal. That was the only issue at COP21. You wouldn't know that if you li 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 listen to most of the news, but that's what we need to do, and how do you do that? Thanks. <laughs> Sounds challenging. It, it uh, is. There's this David Lilienthal <laughs> quote. Uh -huh. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Uh, see, speaking of using energy for uh, useful things, uh, this great quote from David Lilienthal, something about how energy is a replacement for the labor of human beings. I really like that because it's like if the energy is doing the work, then the human can. Well, can can I chime in a bit? Yeah, of course. A 17th century nobleman who had 10 slaves, 10 indentured servants, five oxen and five horses, it's a great calculation for the students, got, was getting the equivalent of 3,100 kilowatt hours a year. Of course, the people sacrificing their lives for him wasn't, but he was getting 3,100 kilowatt hours a year. So when 1850 comes around and the Brits developed coal, we knew about coal, but we hadn't developed the infrastructure to use it. They took off in, in 20 years, they had something unknown in the history of humanity, a middle class. There were 10 million middle-class Brits in 1870, and they had enough coal to coke steel, so they were building steel battleships, and everyone else was building wooden battleships. Yeah. So, again, it, 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 energy basically underlies all of history, all of, all of society, and there's nothing you can talk about that doesn't have energy involved in it. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so that's total world energy. So, Mark, what's the current worldwide status of commercial nuclear energy production? Yeah, so actually, I, I can't help but miss uh, the uh, statement over there about 60% of carbon-free energy. So if you look right now, uh, I think from the world's power, it's about 12% are being generated by nuclear power. And um, that's like 450 plants. And, you know, the U.S. has approximately 100. I mean, it is varying now with un unfortunate things that are happening. Uh, and then the other thing that's interesting to me is to look at what countries are building plants. And the really outstanding example is China which has about 20 under construction. That's an enormous number. Uh, and they actually seem to have pretty much purchased any plant they could get their hands on. Uh, so that means things like uh, online reactors like can -dos, you know, uh, pressurized water, boiling water, uh, the Russian type reactors, whatever they could get. And I did talk to a fellow from uh, the Chinese uh, Institute of Atomic Energy, and they were really nervous about that because they're looking at potentially doing reprocessing. And when you have a great diversity in reactors, it actually makes it harder to do that uh, in terms of the way the plant operates. But you quickly drop down. Russia has about seven being built right now. Uh, India's around five. Uh, then you hit lower numbers. And one interesting one is uh, United Arab Emirates, a country that just has all the fossil fuel it could ever imagine, is building four nuclear power plants. The South Koreans are actually building it. Uh, the US, you already heard Nick talk about the sad story here. Uh, a storied company like Westinghouse going bankrupt. The uh, initial projections on what these power plants at summer would cost have, have doubled, doubled, and are already billions of dollars. And so they, they shut down that work. Uh, there are two more that are still under construction. I don't know how that's going to work out. They also have delays. They also have increased costs in Vogel. Uh, so anyway, um, it's really, it's significant, but it's true in the U.S. It could be reducing a lot, right? Because plants, even ones that are operating efficiently are being driven out of the market due to cost. So it's, yeah. we don't know where that's going to go. And we're going to go into that in a little bit of detail in a little while. But yeah, it's an interesting story. Yeah, that point that 60% of the electricity that's carbon free in this country is generated by nuclear reactors, I think is pretty astounding. So that they are currently our climate champions, uh, followed by hydro and then the, the renewables. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty significant chunk of, of our clean energy. Anyway, moderate. Uh, Lenka, so speaking of all this climate change, uh, how does nuclear power relate to climate change? I mean, we've kind of alluded to it, but... Yeah, we've alluded to more. it. So let's uh, describe the graph on, the, on this... Uh, uh, what is that banner over here in a little bit more close detail. So a life cycle carbon equivalent emission, how they really measure that is they look at the entire life cycle of an energy source. So when you're talking about solar, for example, it's everything from mining the materials to making the solar panels. 
um, to transporting them to where they need to go. Nuclear is measured in the same way, so it goes from mining to uh, cement that's needed for the re to build the power plants, and that has actually a pretty large uh, carbon footprint as the cement is where most of the nuclear footprint comes from. Um, and when you compare these on a life cycle basis, um, nuclear is about the same as wind, um, then you have hydro, and what's that, geothermal, and then solar goes up from there. Um, and then you have the fossil fuels who obviously emit a lot of greenhouse gases um, during operation. Nuclear does not emit greenhouse gases during operation, so that life cycle footprint comes from the construction. So what does that mean for climate change? Well, we're, as, uh, as Jim described, we're going to need a lot of energy in the future. Um, and with many projections from the Energy Information Administration, the International Energy Agency, and the International International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So all these international bodies basically project out that our world energy demand is going to increase by at least 30% and that a half to three quarters of that fossil fuel, of that energy will still be fulfilled by fossil fuels in the next couple of decades. So even with renewables growing exponentially at the rate that they are and getting cheaper and cheaper, it still won't be enough to decarbonize um, the electricity sector, let alone transportation and industry. So we have a lot to decarbonize and nuclear can play a huge role in that. Not only in providing the electricity to back up renewables, but also in being able to de decarbonize industrial sectors. For example, cement manufacturing, that's a process that just creates carbon from the manufacturing process. So you can use nuclear energy for that energy intensive process and then also you're going to need things like carbon capture to cap on that carbon. Sounds great. So no problems with nuclear energy then, right? <laughs> so Jim, uh, you're a nuclear waste expert. What is nuclear waste and what's the problem with it? What can we do? So we can't go to slide A, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, no, we can't. Slide, 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 slide A would be good. I'm glad you're <laughs> so there's four, there's four categories of nuclear waste, okay? There's spent nuclear fuel from a commercial reactor. That's, that's the, the easiest one to deal with because it's solid, it doesn't leak, there's no liquid. Um, I, 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 I know when everyone's watching The Simpsons, the green goo that comes out, that's, that's weapons waste, okay? that's weapons waste. So, which is high level waste. So high level waste is only weapons waste. People get that confused. High level waste is only weapons waste and it's just hot, hot, hot weapons waste. It's kind of the peanut butter stuff in the tanks at Hanford. I mean, it's kind of nasty. It's got salt cake, it's, it's, it's gooey, it's, it's gross. Um, then there's transuranic waste, which is another type of bomb waste. Uh, about, about a fifth of the tanks in Hanford are filled with transuranic waste. It's not as hot, but some of it can be hot, some of it not hot. It's simply plutonium, uranium, waste from making weapons, okay? It doesn't have a, a lot of gamma emitters in it. That, that's the only thing. And then there's low-level waste, which is dirt, you know, contaminated clothing and stuff like that. I mean, it, it, it's, it's very, very low level. The top three require deep geologic disposal, okay? By law, you have to, you have to put them in a deep geologic disposal about a half mile or more below the earth. Uh, and again, you pick the right rock and it's great. Um, next slide. If you care to know what Hanford is, oops, I'm a Mac user, uh, didn't translate all that well. But if you want to know what the tank, the tank waste is, do, do, do you want me to go into the tank waste at Hanford? It's actually critical to, to, to us. Um, it has nothing to do with nuclear in energy, but it is waste. So when you, a weapons reactor is completely different than a, uh, an energy reactor, okay? Weapons reactors are simply make weapons. They do not make electricity. Okay, so North Korea couldn't make electricity from its weapons reactor even if it wanted to. The nine reactors at Hanford in the 40s, 50s, and 60s were only to make plutonium for bombs, period. So when you run those quickly, um, you actually, you only run them for, for six months because you don't want to ingrow any poisons. And so you quickly take them out, dissolve them up in acid, and run them through a series of test, uh, batch tests to, to remove the plutonium. And that's what all this is. When you, when you dissolve them and take out all of the fission products or the non-plutonium, non-uranium constituents, they go into the high-level single-shell tanks at Hanford, okay, 177 of them. Okay. The next steps, the, the fourth and fifth steps, are polishing. You're, you're, you're pretty much polishing the plutonium and uranium so you can use them in bombs, because bombs have to be all uranium-235 or all plutonium-239. Plutonium you can't have anything else in them, so you, you're basically polishing that. That goes into the other tanks there, and most of those are leaking. 
okay, at Hinford, um, which is why we actually got to get the nuclear waste issue under control because we know what to do with it. We're simply not allowed to do it correctly. So that's the Hank for tanks. It has nothing to do with energy, everything to do with bombs, um, and they've been sitting there for decades. Uh, we know what to do with them. It's a piece of cake. We're just not doing it. Good. No, I, I, I think that's it. Good. Thanks. All right. Very interesting. So, uh, so Lenka, um, what are the relative risks between different energy options? I think everybody here probably remembers Fukushima. So what, what are the relative risks between nuclear and other alternatives? Well, I think when we talk about nuclear safety, um, I think Jim has some great numbers to share with you. But I think before we go into that, we uh, have to remember that electricity actually saves lives. So even coal saves lives. Um, it, by providing electricity, you're simply increasing the people's quality of life by so much that even though it's a risky technology, coal, we still use it because it's good for us. Um, and this is what Jim was alluding to earlier, how it makes our lives better. So when I talk about safety of nuclear power, I, I don't think we can afford not to use it. Um, there have definitely been accidents in the past, and you've heard about them because there's been so few of them. And we've learned a lot from those. So regulations have changed after every accident. Um, with any new technology, there's definitely going to be hiccups. Um, and we've learned from the past few decades of this operating experience of operating nuclear reactors. So I'll be talking a little bit more about our advanced technology um, a little bit later, but I think that's what we've really learned from the experience of the past few decades, and that's allowed us to create technologies that can be inherently safe in which the uh, types of accidents you've seen in the past wouldn't happen. Can go to slide seven. Slide seven. <laughs> These are the numbers. This is the mortality rate per trillion kilowatt hours produced by each of these sources. This is totally normalized. Now, China is reeling from this. In 1992, they started building 600 coal-fired power plants simply to lift 500 million people up out of abject poverty. Now, they still have 800 million in abject poverty, so they're still going to build more coal, more gas, and they're planning 400 new nuclear plants by, by, 40, by 2050 because they know this. This isn't any secret. So again, the global average death print for coal is about 100,000 per trillion kilowatt hours produced. Now, in the United States, we only kill about 10,000 a year with coal. It's not bad. It's supposed to get a laugh. So we only kill about 10,000. That's OK. Um, <laughs> oil, again, the, the fossil fuels kill more people, even biomass. The, the World Health Organization just uh, classified biomass as a, as, an epi as a health epidemic in the world because the lungs just don't like to breathe in burnt carbon. That's just the way it is. It's, it's like, that's why smoking is bad. So think of coal as secondhand smoke. That, that's what it's like. Um, and, and, and then you get down to the, to the non-fossil fuels. You get solar, um, wind, hydro, nuclear. They're much less, and those are all accidents, and all accidents. So, so if you look at you know, wind, I mean, that's, that's not bad. And you know, 150, that's much, much better than, than, than the others. And, but notice that I have global, then US, for coal, hydro, and nuclear. Why is, why is the US number so much lower? Why do we kill so fewer people? Shout it out, come on. Regulation, regulation, regulation. regulation. So the reason coal is better is because of the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act dropped our death print from coal from about 100,000 to 10. That's not bad. Um, hydro, what's, why, why is hydro so much better? FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they actually inspect dams, and they shut them down when they find a crack, like they did the Priest Rapids Dam a couple years ago. Okay? Other countries actually don't do that. Um, and then nuclear, why is nuclear so low? NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Again, they will shut down any nuclear reactor that they don't think is running safely, period. And they'll shut it down, and no one can say anything about it which is kind of funny. But again, the other places, no. I mean, we had been telling Fukushima, TEPCO, for 10 years before Fukushima that their seawall was crap, their backup generation was inadequate, and they hadn't even drilled. So, you know, and they invented the word tsunami, so it's kind of, kind of disappointing. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yes, actually, more, more radioactive emissions occur from coal than any other source because there's a lot of uranium and thorium and, and radon in coal. 
How, how do people die from solar? This is not falling off. I, I actually have a, a solar panel on my roof. There's a part of my roof that is so dangerous I will not go up there. And these guys were running around, not even roped up. It's a 40 foot drop. And occasionally they fall off, break their necks. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> but yeah, no, and, and wind too. That's the same thing. It's maintenance on wind turbines. And if you don't rope up, you can die. I don't know why we don't rope up everyone that's above 10 feet. I mean, that's insane. But we do. All right. Uh, all right. So, Mark, how about um, can you tell us a little bit about how nuclear reactors relate to nuclear weapons? Uh, I mentioned the Manhattan Project, but what's the relation? Uh, and how can we prevent proliferation of weapons? Sure. And, and by the way, there's been a request if you stand up while you talk, because you're kind of low. The speakers should all stand. He's not low. I'm yeah. low. Not when he stands up. So uh, my slides would be helpful, because I want to try to characterize. Let's go to number two. We don't need to front. I just want to, uh, so the International Atomic Energy Agency, you probably all know about it now. It's been in the news a lot because of the uranium activities, what happened in Iraq some years ago. Uh, but really, it's kind of the watchdog, right? People sign up to the non-proliferation treaty. But what I wanted to do, we've heard NRC. There really is a distinct difference between what the IEA does versus what something like an NRC does. So the IEA, the most important thing is that the state is the adversary or the potential adversary, and therefore that's unlimited capability. It's a very tough adversary. Uh, whereas when you look at something like an NRC, they're worried about subnational threats, insider threats, and of course I'm talking here about safeguards, not safety, there are a lot of other issues. Uh, also, you already heard NRC can shut them down, they can fine them, IEA can't do that. IEA can't even say, please don't build that, we can't safeguard it well. That's where people who, who develop technology for different advanced reactors and so forth are really important to the IEA. The other thing is, uh, and this really kind of came out of the, what happened in Iraq, where Iraq essentially had weapons activities going on uh, in the same building complex where they were doing what they call declared activities. So uh, what they declared was correct, but what they didn't do is declare everything. So it wasn't complete. So that's just a general concept that the agency uses. So let's go to the next slide. So this is the fuel cycle. I know a lot of you here are in nuclear engineering, so uh, not a big deal here. But look where reactors sit. You've already heard about reactors being used uh, for uh, plutonium production. Uh, so this is we're looking at the civilian nuclear fuel cycle. So you have uh, what happens here, milling. You have the processing, enrichment, fabrication. There is a reactor at the crossover point between what they call the front end versus the back end. Here, for example, you could do reprocessing to extract plutonium. We know the U.S. on the civilian side has decided not to do that, right? It's once through, and therefore they wanted to go directly to storage with the spent fuel. Uh, the other thing I should just mention here is that the black lines uh, are what the agency was allowed to do uh, before the discoveries in Iraq. Now there's some new agreements or protocols that give them the full nuclear fuel cycle, which is an important advantage. Let's go to the next slide. We're going to take this, and now we're going to go to weaponization, all right? We've already heard about uh, the way uh, nuclear, uh, high energy nuclear power was, was introduced to weapons, unfortunately. But look at the pathway. Uh, you have the reactor just like you had before. That's the same nuclear fuel cycle with the reactor up in the center. But notice here, if you can enrich up to high enriched uranium, you can develop a U-235 weapon. If you go to the other side, uh, the reprocessing, we've already heard discussions about pulling out the plutonium. There you can convert again to metal, and that's in fact, some of the activities that I saw when I was at Los Alamos, of course. So if you look at that, you realize the agency has limited resources. They need to put their inspectors where it's most critical to stop weaponization. They're going to focus primarily on enrichment and reprocessing. All right? Uh, yes, there are 450 reactors around the world, but they're not difficult to safeguard. Right? These are the typical light water reactors. There are some other more strange advanced reactors that could become more challenging. But I would tell you that myself as an inspector, I had a choice. I could work on item facilities, which is what a reactor is, because as Jim mentioned, uh, the material doesn't convert. It stays in the form of a, of a spent a fuel assembly, and then assembly goes in, it sits in a core and comes out. Now, of course, there are things going on inside, but the point is there's no processing. There's no liquid and gases and powders, whereas the rest of the fuel cycle there are. Those are bulk facilities. Those are very difficult to safeguard, and that's far more interesting to me. So to me, from a safeguard standpoint, reactors were boring. I wasn't interested. So as a safeguards inspector, 
I stayed away from item facilities and I worked on bulk facilities because that's really where the challenge is. And the challenge is not only the quantities and the type of processing, but you always have measurement uncertainty. Uh, and that can be used against you to divert material. So it's really kind of an interesting challenge. Okay, so we see now that the reactor, in this case, is producing the plutonium that could go down to a weapon stream. Let's go to the next slide. So how does the agency handle that? Well, back in the 70s, the literally agency was asking itself, what am I looking for and how frequently do I need to draw conclusions? And that's what this chart is. If you look on the far right, you have SQs, what are known as significant quantities. And then if you look at the notation for that, it's the approximate amount for the possibility of manufacturing a weapon cannot be excluded. It's not the amount needed for a weapon, but if you do processing, you have process losses, it's something that could indicate that potentially some weaponization is going on. The other thing was how often do you have to draw conclusions, and those are the timeliness goals. Uh, and, and you can just look at the different materials there. You also notice the quantities for plutonium and U-233 are the smallest. You get larger when you go to high enriched or natural uranium and so forth. Uh, the other thing you need to realize is these materials are extremely dense, right? Plutonium and uranium are about 75% denser than lead. Uh, so you heard an analogy of what a Coke can, the energy you could have in it. Well, a Coke can is about 8 kgs of plutonium. And if you're in a, in a facility that is processing 1,000 kilograms of plutonium, it's really tough to find out if they're missing a Coke can's worth of material. That's part of the challenge. Let's go to the next slide. So this is what the agency is trying to draw conclusions on about a state, and it is for the state as a whole. And that's something too important to remember. So while the agency inspects the facility, they really look at the entire capability of a state. What could they do if they were the bad guy? What's their capability? If all they have are reactors, a good example would be United Arab Emirates. They're just building four reactors. They don't have any other capability. There's a low risk there. If you look at other countries that have very high capabilities, uh, Japan is an example of that. Even if you look at Iran right now, they have really very good capabilities. In fact, that original diagram of weaponization uh, really helped the U.S. and the European and the other, other partners in this, uh, this joint agreement to focus down on those enrichment and uh, plutonium uh, processing areas. That's really where they tightened down on the Iranians in terms of what they could do. The only downside I see of that agreement is the fact that it doesn't last forever. Uh, but they really did nail uh, the enrichment side and the reprocessing side, or the potential plutonium production side. Anyway, what do they want to say about a state? They'd like to say that there's no detection or diversion from their declared. Remember that this is a cooperative agreement. A state is supposed to be transparent. Uh, I'll give you an example of transparency. Uh, I'll talk a little about it later, but the fact is that if you're going to build a nuclear facility, and I'm the IEA, if you tell me early on before you start construction, I can first of all try to design in safeguards, which is good because it's very expensive to retrofit a nuclear facility, uh, but also I can be there during construction before you pour the concrete. Uh, that's really the way to have transparent safeguards where I can, because you want to know about the design because you could design in diversion pathways. That's what we want to make sure doesn't happen in the facility. Whereas if you look at something like the Natanz facility in Iran, they basically built the whole thing and they said, oh yeah, that's right, we have this, come on, come on in guys. Uh, so what's in the floor, what's in the ceiling, it's really tough. It makes it much, much harder. So transparency is an important part of the non-proliferation treaty and people who sign up for that. So they also want to know that there isn't any misuse. That is, even in a declared facility, whether there might be some misuse. So an example of that would be is if I have a reprocessing facility and I'm only using 50% of the capacity, maybe I could bring in some streams I'm not declaring and I can process that. And what I do declare looks normal, but in fact misuse is going on. Uh, you could do that in a reactor. In a reactor, you could actually have other materials, U-238, you could put in certain parts of the reactor separately from the fuel to produce the plutonium, put it in and take it out. The regular fuel in that reactor is all there. It will match up with the inventory listing. So that's the idea of misuse. And then finally, and the toughest one of all, is the absence of undeclared. That's really unequivocally the greatest challenge for the IEA, trying to find the needle in the haystack in a country. And then the last thing I'll say is that we actually have been funded, not just Pacific Northwest National Lab, but a number of the national labs uh, have been funded to look at some of these new reactor designs. And just out of coincidence, 
We happen to look at new scale uh, and terapower, so we maybe can talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we've already done that. We're now looking at micro reactors, if any of you follow that. These really small reactors that can go to remote places like in Canada and so forth. And, and what are the safeguards challenges there? Thanks a lot. All right, let's shift gears into markets a little bit. Uh, Lenka, some plants in the United States and other places are shutting down before they're designed uh, lifetime. So why, why is that happening and what are the implications of that on climate change? Sure, I'll stand up. Yes. Okay. Oh, now it's blinding me though. <laughs> okay. So I think, uh, you know, nuclear plants are having a hard time competing right now in the U.S. Uh, we have a lot of cheap natural gas. Uh, so that's uh, causing, you know, an influx of energy onto the grid. Um, it's really cheap. It's really it's really just making it challenging for nuclear plants, especially in deregulated markets, to compete on a bid-type basis where they're bidding into a market even sometimes on the five-minute level to compete with really cheap natural gas. So what we have seen is that when a nuclear plant shuts down in the U.S., the emissions in that state go up immediately because it's usually replaced by natural gas capacity. Um, and that's not good for lowering our emissions as a country. Um, so I'm part of, I'm on the board of Generation Atomic, which uh, Eric, who was singing before, leads. And uh, they work on the state level to try to save some of these nuclear plants. Um, some successes were in Illinois and New York, where they actually instituted state level zero emission credits so that they would get subsidies similar to what renewables get for having zero emissions. Um, what was the other part of the question? Okay, I think I got that. So yeah. emissions go up, not good for climate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, it, I was just at the American Nuclear Society <coughs> conference in D.C., and there was a lot of talk about energy markets, and especially in deregulated markets. And it, there was this over, the big thought was, I mean, we're, we're basically, we're giving the intermittent renewables a lot of credit for their attributes, their zero emissions, and we're giving them a, a benefit for that. And of course, we've given nuclear benefit too. The U.S. government put a lot of money into the development of the technology, you know, starting with the Manhattan Project and then going on through. Uh, so, you know, has it had its chance already, or uh, is there still a reasonable argument to be made for uh, giving, basically, paying nuclear for the valuing nuclear for the attributes that it actually has? I want to throw that one at Jim a little bit. Slide six. Yeah. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the life cycle cost of each source unsubsidized. Unsubsidized. So, uh, again, gas, that's why we're building gas. Gas is cheap. The gas itself is cheap. It's easy to throw up a gas plant. doesn't require much cement. doesn't require much steel. You can just throw it up in a year. The, the regulators, regulators love it. And, of course, it's better than coal. But it's still a fossil fuel. So that's why gas is so so is being built so often. Now, nuclear you know, isn't, isn't expensive. Wind's a little bit more expensive, solar's a little bit more expensive, but if you, but if you use the production tax credits for renewables and the, the, um, uh, the, the, the construction tax credits for renewables, that 11 cents goes down to seven, and that 13 cents goes down to 10. And so, so suddenly they are cheaper. They're not really cheaper. You're just switching the, the cost from the rate payer to the taxpayer. And since we don't know what our taxes go to anyway, no one cares or even notices. <laughs> but at the end of the month, in your bill, it looks like it's cheap. Okay, is that good? I love socialized electricity. I love so socialized medicine. medicine. That's great. But, but again, back up one slide. These are not all that different, except gas is cheap. But they're not really that different. I'm sorry, back up, yeah. It turns out energy is the cheapest it's ever been in the history of humanity, right now. It's the cheapest it has ever been. And because of that, food is, is cheaper than it's ever been. Okay, now you can see that little, that little um, peak there. Point to it. Yeah, that little peak, which was the 1973 oil embargo, in a bizarre, uh, which was totally fabricated, but that's okay. So, so anyway, so it's cheaper than it's ever been. And so if you're going to make huge changes now in, in, in our electrical sources, now is the time to do it because energy is so cheap. All right, thanks. Okay, so uh, 25 minutes left before we open it up. So let's shift over to advanced reactors a little bit. Uh, so 
as I said, I work at TerraPower, which is an advanced reactor company, and there's there's different definitions of advanced reactor. There's and basically it's there's the traditional light water reactors and the things we have in operation, including some gas reactors and heavy water reactors in Canada. And then there's everything else, and everything else is basically uh, advanced reactors. Uh, there's the there's new scale, which Lenka will talk about, which is a uh, it's more similar to the current reactors, but has some attributes that make it advanced. And then there's things like the Terra Power Reactor, uh, or the Traveling Wave Reactor, and the Molten Salt Reactors, and maybe you've heard of Thorium Fuel as an advanced type of fuel. I know Eric has. Wasn't that the YouTube video that you saw? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, uh, so I'll just talk briefly about Terra Power's reactor, uh, the Traveling Wave Reactor in particular. So this is a sodium-cooled fast neutron reactor and that gives you a couple different advantages. The sodium coolant is a liquid metal, like mercury, kind of, and the advantage of that as a coolant is, first of all, it's a great heat transfer mechanism, it's a metal, uh, and second of all, it boils close to 1,000 Celsius instead of 100 Celsius like water. So when you're running your reactor, you don't have to pressurize it. So if there's a leak anywhere in your heat transfer path, uh, there's no motive force to push your coolant out there. Now, in a, in a water-cooled reactor, if there's any kind of leak or a hole or a valve stuck open, Three Mile Island, um, the water can just sh shoot out. And if the water level goes out and you, uh, it goes down below where your nuclear fuel is, that can start to heat up and it can melt and the radionuclides can get out, which is a meltdown, which is what you don't want. So, uh, and so there's a bunch of active pump systems and backup cooling systems in light water reactors that prevent that from happening, but they have to have power usually or backup gen generators. So at Fukushima, the backup generators didn't have a fuel source because the tsunami took it out. They should have put it above the flood line. That's another story. Um, but in a, in a sodium cooled reactor, you don't have to worry about that because if all the power goes out and you have a leak somewhere, none of the cooling goes anywhere and it just sits there and naturally circulates. It heats up, it moves up, and then it can dump its heat to the atmosphere totally passively using the laws of physics to keep itself cool in basically any kind of postulated event. So you get this huge advantage in safety. Uh, and then another thing you get is, I said it's a fast reactor. That just means the neutrons are going faster than usual in a, in a thermal reactor, which just means slow neutron reactor. If you have a really fast moving neutron, then that atom, that neutron can split basically any heavy nuclide it sees. It doesn't have to be uranium-235 or plutonium-239. It can turn the majority isotope of uranium, uranium-238, into fuel, either by breeding it up to plutonium and then splitting it, or by just directly fissioning the uranium-238. And so you get this uh, two orders of magnitude more energy out of the same amount of fuel. And so with this kind of reactor, that's called a breeder reactor, when you have that kind of reactor, uh, nuclear fuel is basically, it's effectively renewable. There's enough fuel uh, on Earth to last for, I mean, in the crust that we know about to last for tens of thousands of years. And if you start pulling it out of the stuff that's dissolved in seawater, it'll last you on the order of billions of years at full scale world energies. So you don't have to worry about the fuel source. So anyway, oh, and also you can, uh, you can burn nuclear waste. So you can take, you can, uh, recycle the waste with that reprocessing plant, put it back in, and now the waste decays down to safe levels on the order of 500 years as opposed to 100,000 years. So your repository that you have to build, you can license it to 500 years, which is a lot easier than licensing it to 100,000 years. So anyway, uh, that's that's what the TerraPower reactor basically does. It has some other features. That's, that, <laughs> I'm going to stop there. <laughs> uh, but you know you have question time afterwards. If you want to hear more, I'll let you decide. Uh, and so, Lenka, if you could just tell us a little bit about the new scale reactor. Sure. If you could go to my slides, that'd be great. So, as I mentioned before, new scale is based in Oregon. We started out as a project at the Oregon State University um, from the Department of Energy, which basically gave money to a project to create a small reactor that could do multiple things. So, do things provide energy and heat for things other than electricity and make it a multi-application reactor. Let me go next. And what they came up with, and this was found by Dr. Jose Reyes um, in the early 2000s, um, was what we call now a small modular reactor. 
And what this means is that it's basically taken the idea of a large pressurized, pressurized light water reactor and stripped out a lot of the systems to make it more efficient um, and run on natural circulation and taken the core and made it a lot smaller. This is the module um, that we work with and the core is down here in the bottom. What happens here is uh, water is filled in the entirety of the module and it basically Here's where fission is happening. Heat is being re released. Water is uh, heated up in this area and it's pressurized so it doesn't boil. It rises and then there is a, a steam generator, so basically a heat exchanger, that's coiled through the module. Um, in that steam generator is where the steam is produced, then exits the module to run a turbine which spins a generator and produces electricity. Uh, that water then circulates back down into the core and runs that way through natural circulation. So this system doesn't have any pumps. Um, it doesn't have any large valves or pipes coming out of the module, so it alleviates a lot of the um, operating issues that we've had and accident issues that we've had in the past with um, nuclear reactors. And in this system, what's also really cool about it is that it can be manufactured wholly in a factory. So you make this entire thing in a factory and then ship it on site and put it into this uh, reactor building. So click next. So again, here's the module. It's placed in a reactor building. Um, and there's in our system that we've designed for the US, which we are currently getting licensed um, by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we're the first um, of this group of advanced reactors that Nick mentioned to be going through the licensing process um, with the NRC. And this, this, um, re this plant design includes 12 modules of 50 megawatts each, so it's a 600 megawatt plant. It's about this size. Next. And the advantages of this approach is, like I said before, we can fabricate the modules completely in a factory, and then they're shipped on site, can be shipped on a truck, uh, put, placed into the plant, that's where it's fueled, so it's not shipped with the fuel, it's fueled at the plant, and then essentially plugged in to generate electricity. Um, and also this approach uh, makes it very flexible because each module has its own turbine train. So you can manipulate that secondary side of the plant to produce electricity or do other things, click, which um, we call our Beyond Baseload or Diverse Energy Platform. So what we're looking at is when you don't, for example, need to be using this module to produce electricity because it's nighttime or that community hasn't grown to the level where it needs all that electricity yet, you can use it for other things. So it's flexible enough to be run to load follow with a wind farm, for example, so it can actually enable more uh, wind growth on the grid um, by being able to back it up. Um, the power is extremely reliable, so we can use it for mission critical facilities like hospitals, army bases, um, data centers. And then when you don't need to be using it for electricity, you can use it for um, oil refineries, so um, these process heat applications that need a lot of high energy heat in order to operate. Again, this is part of what I was talking about before where there's a lot more than just the electricity sector to decarbonize. Um, we can also use it for hydrogen production. I find this one really interesting um, because we can manipulate the secondary side of the plant to produce hydrogen when electricity is cheap, is too cheap for nuclear to be putting it online. So we could be using hydrogen for energy storage or even um, selling it on the market to, for fuel cell cars, which are being invested quite a bit in um, some parts of the world, like California and Germany are investing in hydrogen fuel cell car infrastructure. And then finally, um, we've also partnered and done a couple of studies on the capability of these modules to be used for desalination. Um, a lot of parts of the world, primarily in the Middle East, um, still rely on de or rely on desalination for their clean water needs. And all of this desalination is currently done with fossil fuels. So um, a new scale plant for, could, for example, provide electricity and enough clean water um, for a community of about 300,000 people. And looking at a plant that can do the these um, multiple kinds of uses is really attractive. So that's all. So, so size actually matters. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, the 
the ability to build it in a factory, I think, is extremely important because a lot of the cost overruns at plants uh, that we've seen are because they're sort of one-off type designs. And uh, when you have a one-off design, you haven't learned all the lessons of it. When you start sort of piecing it together out at the site, you run into these problems where you start having long delays and uh, you're paying off this huge amount of financing. And so that really is a problem. Whereas if you can build it in a really controlled environment like a factory, you can totally uh, build them perfectly every time you get better quality and you should be able to bring the capital cost down pretty dramatically. So that's a really exciting idea. I, I do want to mention Westinghouse went bankrupt because of mismanagement, not because of the technology. The technology didn't matter. It was total mismanagement. And that's because you have a huge lengthy operation like building the Golden Gate Bridge. If you start and stop, start and stop, the cost is going to go up. It always does uh, throughout history. It doesn't matter. You need to start a project and you need to finish it. And, that, and if your management isn't up to it, then it's going to fail. Yeah. Good point. So, Mark, uh, you said you analyzed some of the advanced reactors from a proliferation perspective. How is it different than traditional reactors, or what do you see in the future for, for these guys? So, uh, it certainly wasn't just me. This was a team that worked on it. And uh, I think, actually, I want to connect the dot first. And that is, we talked. remember we talked about significant quantity in 8 kgs of plutonium? So to link that for you, if you look at typical light water reactors with the typical burn-up that they have, one spent fuel assembly has about half of an SQ, so around around 4 kgs. And you realize in this country now, since there are no place for them to go, there are thousands of these spent fuel assemblies. So just think about it. Two of them could enable you to potentially make a weapon. So that's why there's a focus on what's coming out of a reactor. So now these reactors, which are different, and I think since Nick talked about TerraPower first. We'll talk about that one. And there are different versions of it, but I'm thinking about their commercial scale one. You already heard it's sodium. That's an opa opaque coolant. So it's not like water. You can't go look into the core and see the spent fuel assemblies. It's also pyrophoric. You can't expose it to air, so that's very limiting in terms of what you can see. So typical light water reactors, they every 12 or 14 months, they pop the lid off and the agency can be there and witness the refueling activities, see what's in there, see what's coming out from fresh, see what's going into spent, and basically verify what the operator is doing. And that's what the agency does. It verifies declarations, and it does so independently. So, for example, the IEA doesn't say, like, oh, if NRC is doing it, we're not going to do it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, if they want to show that they're independent and transparent, and that essentially this country is, is a good guy, the agency has to verify it independently. It doesn't matter. They don't assess a country as being high or low risk in terms of whether they trust them. They just have to be non-discriminatory of whether they do it. So, so TerraPower, in terms of their reactor, there's actually something really interesting about this reactor that makes safeguards a lot easier. All right. Uh, first of all, the agency has already safeguarded sodium-cooled reactors. Japan's a good example with Manju and Joyo. Uh, even though you can't see it, we can set up equipment to essentially track the movement of the fuel throughout that facility. So we can see it from its emission, right? That's the nice thing about radioactive material, uh, is that you don't have to necessarily sample it. It's emitting gamma rays, it's emitting neutrons or whatever, and we have ways to detect that and even quantify the materials. Uh, so we can do that. We can have automated systems. Uh, so typically, though, we have to worry about timeliness criteria for fresh fuel, for the core, the core is okay, we can seal it up, pop the lid on it, uh, like every 12, 14 months when the operator does it. And then the spent fuel, we have to look at that all the time because that has all the plutonium. So there'll be cameras set up looking at a spent fuel pond. Well, the interesting thing about TerraPower, at least not only are they going to run a long time, and I don't know what you're estimating now, about 20 years or more, that the core will operate without having to be opened, but they're also putting all the fresh fuel and all the spent fuel in the core itself. So now, I don't have a fresh fuel storage area. I don't have a spent fuel storage area on site. That really simplifies safeguards. Now there's just a core, and a core actually is its own containment, and I can apply IA seals to it. Uh, so it's really simplified safeguards. Now when that core opens up, there are of course other issues associated with that, but the agency has worked with other sodium cooled reactors. If we look at new scale, it's a PWR, right? It's a smaller PWR. The agency already does pressurized water reactors, all right? And I think the assemblies are about half the size of a typical one. So instead of um, four kilograms of plutonium, let's just assume it's two kilograms. It's still quite a lot in, in the spent fuel. What makes new scale potentially um, challenging 
and this would depend on how the operator runs it. If it's a really, if it's a multi-unit and has 12 modules or 10 or whatever they want, uh, for efficiency's sake, uh, they're looking potentially at doing refueling every two months on a different module. Very, very different, right? Instead of 12 to 14 months, now suddenly every two months, this core is going to be opened up. Well, the agency has always had to deal with the fact that it really can't verify everything that an operator has. Mm -hmm. And so they've always used game theory and random statistical sampling to put the operator at risk. So the operator doesn't know what you're going to look at, uh, and therefore the idea is that you have a certain confidence level. So for example, if I go into, let's say you're all cancer plutonium in a vault sitting here right now, uh, I could do random statistical sampling, even such that I don't even know what I'm going to pick, because I, I generate random numbers according to the inventory listing. Uh, so it's really a very neutral approach, and depending on the amount of material in each can, there's a statistical sampling plan for that, and I can reach some conclusion that I have 90% 90, 90 confidence that less than 8 kgs are missing. Now that only works if I don't find a defect in the population. Once I find a defect, that's thrown out the door, and all the population is, is suspect. So that's the risk the operator takes, and doesn't want to take, frankly. And if you look at the way people have been uh, trying to develop their weapons program, typically they don't bother with IA safeguard facilities. They've been building clandestine facilities because now there's a lot of indigenous capability. Early on, there were cases found in the early, early era of building facilities when the country didn't have capability where they were trying to build in diversion pathways, which fortunately were, were discovered and, and, uh, and basically shut down. But anyway, so New Scale, we have this interesting thing where every two months, potentially, a core is being opened. There's no way the agency has the resources to show up every two months for one reactor. Mm -hmm. But if they randomize their approach and do what's known as an unannounced inspection, they can still put the risk on the operators to not knowing when the agency is going to show up. And they can show up less frequently and still be just as effective as if they showed up every time. The other thing, that interesting twist on this, is there's something called a mailbox. Now, you all know what a mailbox is if you've ever mailed a letter. Most of you probably never have when I think about it now uh, with the internet and email. But if you ever did mail a letter, uh, the idea, the concept here is that since the agency verifies what the operator declares, why not have the operator make a declaration on some period of time, maybe once a month, maybe once every two weeks, and send it literally via email. So it's a one-way mailbox where they declare, we're going to do the following things over this period of time. All right? So they basically have said, this is what we're going to do. Uh, now, you may not show up, but if you do show up, you're going to take what they put in the mailbox and compare it against what they actually did. So they're held at risk that they actually follow through. Now, it's not to say that there aren't process upsets and things go wrong sometimes, but all those have to be transparent and easy to resolve. So that's what I think. We, have a, we actually have a slide, and you might want to bring up uh, one of my last slides, where we looked at all the different things. Actually, this one here, number nine. So this is a top-down view of New Scale. I don't know if it, it's that accurate, but we did get it from New Scale. But, so these are the units that Lincoln was showing you before, but looking down from the top. And there are various things the agency can do. They can apply a seal, right? They also have seals that are pretty interesting. They have fiber optic seals uh, that actually send a pulse of light through the fiber. And the seal itself um, has storage capability. So it's not meant to prevent someone from opening the seal. It is meant to record. And therefore, the agency can then dump that information out and see when these different modules were opened and closed. In other words, the operator can open and close the seal, and a record is maintained, and that can be downloaded, and the agency can look at whether it matches what the declaration is. So that's one possibility. <laughs> cameras are very typical. The agency has around 1,400 cameras in the field right now through different kinds of nuclear facilities, primary reactors, looking at spent fuel. Radiation sensors are what they call gate monitors, uh, where fuel gets loaded in, and then uh, in terms of just being brought into the facility, uh, and then actually when these modules get split open, and they actually have refueling activities going on, then fresh fuel is lowered in, and again, the gate will see things going in and out. And when you think about um, how the agency has to monitor activities, there's, there's quantifying nuclear material, but there's also looking at qualitative information. You told me that 10 things went by this point in a month. Uh, I need to verify that. And so imagine that if I have a radiation sensor, two of them, and I space them a meter apart, and I timestamp, I can actually de detect 
directional movement, right? Mm -hmm. This is all recorded automatically, independently from the operator. And essentially, they can, they can, this is the idea of unattended monitoring, where you can actually uh, monitor this. And on top of that, now, the agency is also remotely transmitting this data. So without even being in the facility, they can actually monitor it back in Vienna, for example, or they have other offices, Tokyo, Toronto, wherever. They can send that information and actually do verification activities with IEA data without even entering the facility. And that's the whole idea where they're under tremendous stress. Their, their budget's very small. The department, I'm talking about the Department of Safeguards, they have about 250 inspectors. <clears throat> Excuse me, they have, I think their budget's around $140 million. That's less than, you know, one uh, joint strike fighter. Uh, for, the, for the country, for the U.S. So uh, they're always looking for more efficient ways. And so one way would be un unannounced inspections at a facility like this is what I'm, what I'm thinking. But the agency obviously will look at the entire state and decide where they need to focus, whether it's going to be on reactors or obviously if a country has enrichment reprocessing, they'll put their resources where they need it. Thanks. Jim, perspectives on advanced reactors, Regular reactors. Well, the, in the, not, from a climate think, change perspective, right? Especially from from new scale, the, f the fact that that it can't melt down. I mean, it, we haven't talked about that, but it, it cannot melt down, which is incredibly important because it, because surface area to volume ratio is different the way it's in place in the ground. It, if everything goes out, it just bleeds it bleeds heat away without melting down. So that's incredibly important. And, and the molten salt reactors also cannot melt down because. Uh, because the salt just freezes when it, when it, when it gets cold. So, it, it, again, it's the, the, we've done this enough. We learned all the, all the issues from Chernobyl, Fukushima, and Three Mile Island um, to design these so that all of those issues are not there anymore. So that's really, really important. Uh, the, the, the thing about, uh, can we go? Slide four. I'm going to stand up. Sorry. Slide four. <laughs> okay. Um, so... I, I usually ask this question first, what's the fastest growing energy source in the world? What is it? It's coal. Okay, this year was the first time coal has not gone up significantly, the first time. And so when you're talking about climate change, you basically have the bottom, the bottom several, right, from hydro down, that's what you have to fight global warming. That's all you have. If you, if you start spending, you know, wind and solar to replace nuclear, then you're not going to replace coal, which is the issue, and gas. And I, I don't even have oil on here. Oil is, is between coal and gas, uh, but it's all transportation. So if you don't actually engage all of the non-fossil fuel sources, you have no chance of replacing these. It just it doesn't matter. Sorry. You, you have no chance at all. And the build rates, even if you use all the steel in the world produced every year to build wind turbines, you cannot build enough to replace everything else. So you have to choose. You have to say, we're going to get rid of fossil fuel or not. I mean, if you don't want to get rid of fossil fuel, okay. But if you want to do that, you better do it with everything you have that's not fossil fuel, period. You can't, you can't not have hydro. You can't not have nuclear. Because I know it's, you know, wind is screaming up there. I know that. But it's not going to overtake coal quickly enough without the help of hydro, nuclear, and wind, and, and, and so on. So that's pretty much it. Oh, the one before that. There is an urgency here. People talk about urgency, talk about tipping points. This is it. This, this is, we do everything we possibly can to, 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 to replace fossil fuel. And in 2011, we would have had to start uh, decreasing our global emissions by almost 4% a year. Okay, well, we blew that one. Um, 2015, we started, you know, it's like, if we're going to wait now to 2015, we're going to have to start decreasing it by 5% a year. Now we blew that one. So 2020 is coming up, and we're going to have to start decreasing our emissions by 9% a year. Okay, we're not doing this. And you're not going to do this by getting rid of hydro and nuclear, which is your main uh, foil to, to fossil fuel right now. So again, you just need everything. Um, you need all, all of the above, meaning all of the non-fossil fuel. That, that's what you need to do this. If you don't do it, you're not going to meet any climate goals at all. Okay? And, and if, that, if you don't care about that, that's fine. Um, We've got lots of fossil fuel. We have lots and lots of fossil fuel. I don't know if we, I, I'm a geologist. What's happened in the last two years with, with fracking is just amazing. We have drill rigs now that can walk from site to site. Did you know that? We have walking drill rigs, which is bizarre. Um, and we've, we've discovered more gas, more oil. Uh, the fracking is, is just gone like crazy. We have more oil, gas, and coal, coal in this country than everyone else in the world. That's, you, you don't realize, we have so much fossil fuel. 
And it's hard to have humans not use what they have a lot of. Mm -hmm. This is really tricky. Um, so it, it really takes a, a political will, a real will, to stop using fossil fuel, but you better use all of the non-fossil fuels, or this is just, it's okay. I mean, this is, this is reality. This is why Jim Hansen, the, the guru of climate change, says you need nuclear. You do. If you don't use it, you don't use hydro, that's it. We're, we're stuck, because we have so much fossil fuel. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so it's past 7.45, so we're going to open it up to questions. I just want to mention before, uh, you may be wondering things you can do uh, to help. One thing you can do is sign up for Friends of Fission table back there. Another thing you can do is support taxing carbon. And there's lots of other things that we can discuss more if you want to ask the question. But, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll open it up. So, one thing, um, as we open up the floor, um, use the microphones. We'll have Bruno... Uh, there we go, we got two microphones over there. Um, just so you know, we're gonna take one from the crowd. We'll do one, we have, we have this on Facebook Live. So then we'll do one from Facebook Live and then kind of alternate, but we're only gonna take two from Facebook Live because we have some people tuning in. Uh, other ways that you can support, we have a little donation box as well. Um, someone, one of, one of my officers has it and uh, we have a small budget. So that money uh, is definitely goes to uh, supporting the coffee and then also uh, helping to get some of our uh, students to the annual conference at the end of the year. So we'll go ahead and open up to the crowd. Well, one second, Justin. The donation box is outside and if you do donate, you'll get one of these snazzy nuclear literacy boxes to show all your friends that you know more about energy than they do. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just let them know that the, the, the donation is to our INMM student chapter, uh, not Okay, just want to make that clear. <laughs> All right, I see a hand right there. Uh, what is the source of insurance for nuclear power plants? I, I uh, understand they're very hard to insure. No one really wants to do it. Uh, yeah, Price Anderson. <laughs> well, well the, Price Anderson is one thing, but actually, if, if any major... Occur, if any major spill occurs or anything like in, in anything, oil or whatever, uh, the, the government always steps in because the industry never, never deals with it. But the insurance, there, there's an IPO, there's, there's a, I'm sorry, NPO, there's an insurance company for nuclear specifically that all the nuclear plants pay into. And so they have that, yeah. It's expensive, as you'd expect. And then are we taking a Facebook one next or? All right, we'll just go here. Just tell me when you have a face. After that one. It was okay. mentioned earlier that it is very difficult to match up the precise quantity of material with what is being declared. Are there any specific reasons for that, or is it just a matter of numbers, massive quantity? So I, d I don't really recall that. I mean, um, I think. If you look at a nuke material, you almost think of uh, what a bank does, right? A bank needs to know every dollar and where it is. Uh, so there are really stringent requirements, even international target values on how well you must measure your material. The other thing I should mention is that the materials used in the nuclear fuel cycle in that front end are very, very pure. And that actually makes them very easy to measure. Uh, if you look at Nuclear Regulatory Commission and other, other actual regulators I know around the world, for example, uh, they're required to measure things like plutonium and uranium to the nearest gram. Uh, so we really, maybe what you heard me say is that there's measurement uncertainty. Maybe that's what you're thinking about. Yeah. So measurement uncertainty uh, tends to be based on a percentage or what they call multiplicative. And therefore, as you process more and more material, the, the actual material uh, bounds around something you measure becomes larger across an entire facility. Uh, and in some facilities, like uh, the Japanese uh, Rokashio reprocessing facility, which, by the way, is not operating uh, due to Fukushima and other reasons, but if they ever did operate, uh, the measurement uncertainty uh, can be larger than a significant quantity. And so as a consequence of that, as opposed to normal quantification and, and making sure that the uncertainties are smaller than a significant quantity and that what I measure as an inspector versus what the operator declares at the measurement uncertainties overlap and therefore they're equivalent to the same 
That's it's essentially the uncertainty between the two measurements if they over, overlap. Um, what they do for something like a Rocascio facility, they do what they call process monitoring. So they literally, um, minute by minute, day by day, actually look to make sure that the process is operating nominally between certain sample like acid concentrations and so forth. Uh, so they do real-time monitoring. And you only do that when you have this issue uh, with measurement uncertainty. So what I can say is that things are measured as accurately as they can, uh, but there are physics limitations. That's this idea of what the uncertainty is. You literally can't get past that. Uh, but you can have comp compensatory measures like process monitoring in order to follow it. So it's not, now we do have states that make mistakes. We find discrepancies. Usually uh, when, you, when you consider that, there's usually some human in a loop somewhere to record some information and inevitably they'll make a mistake. They'll flip a couple of numbers, flip a couple of letters. Uh, those are typical discrepancies that we find when we go ahead and audit their records and measure their materials and those usually are easily resolved. So we don't normally find any major issues with the inventories. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, we have our, uh, our Facebook question. It comes all the way from Australia. So uh, how is, and it's for Mark, how is the IAEA safeguarding the quality and providence of their monitoring data? Transmission across the world has risks from cyber attack. Oh, I love that question. I love that question, because that's a concern I have too. Uh, so part of the answer is they use traditional techniques, and, and let, me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, when data gets transmitted, so the agency typically has a cabinet stands about six feet high, it's a 19 inch rack, they have all their material in there. First of all, they, they put in, they do things to detect mechanical tampering. Uh, so the way they design it, for example, they don't have external hinges. You know, if I look at the doors um, in this room, I can see that the hinges are on the outside. So if you asked me to seal one of these doors from the outside, I would say I can't do that because if you give me a hammer and a nail, I can pop the hinge pins out without ever touching the seal. So there's a lot of consideration given to uh, try to make every type of um, enclosure to be tamper indicating. That is, somebody has to break something to get in. Uh, remember also that the agency doesn't have to instantly draw conclusions. There are timeliness criteria. Uh, but so anyway, they look at first the mechanical side. Now the specific question though is on the cyber side and I believe the digital data side. And that's a, that's a very good question. When the agency transmits data either between cabinets from sensors or back to Vienna, they usually encrypt the data. Now why do I say usually? Uh, because it ends up, digital systems don't work very well in a high radiation environment. Uh, so the sensors that are used uh, for radiation are analog, right? They're very simple, very robust, very reliable, they've been used for decades and decades. The problem there, of course, is that your adversary might actually tap into a line record the normal signal, and then essentially cut off that signal, play back the normal signal to you. Uh, so the agency does do things, even within those tamper indicating cabinets. Uh, they use different kinds of conduit to try to protect it, but what they're doing right now is they're actually doing studies on ways to do things like using um, a time delay refractometer that goes up and down the cabling uh, so they can detect anyone trying to tap into the line. That's just one example. But if it's digital data, they'll use standard approaches. They buy commercial equipment. They'll use a virtual private network box in order to ship the data in and out between the agency. Uh, but we, we actually have you know, looked and studied at what the agency's doing. I think they're, they're basically doing best practices when it comes to digital data. Uh, states also send information. They have to send uh, reports to the agency saying, What's in the facility? What's arrived? What's left? What's the total inventory in the facility? So even the states will encrypt their data going to the agency, or some states will do hand delivery because they have embassies and missions in the country. They won't even do an electronic transmission. I also will say that uh, recently at p &L, we looked at possibly applying um, <clears throat> some of the ledger technology that's associated with Bitcoin as one possible way to also come up with a robust way to send reporting information and to make sure that it's basically not hackable by using this, uh, this kind of ledger, this electronic ledger. So we are definitely thinking about that. 
Uh, we definitely worry about that, uh, and we definitely do try to take the best practices in terms of the way this equipment is set up and the way data is transmitted. Thanks. So how many people have questions? I just want to get a general idea based on how much time we have left. Okay. I'm going to temporarily limit answers to two minutes until it slows back down. Uh, so who's next? Guy in the middle. I think that's green sweatshirt guy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is another question from Mark. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is the expansion of nuclear, like the nuclear sector, so from maybe 12 to 30, 12% 12 of nuclear power, 12% of global power to like 30 or whatever. Um, in the event that, that does, that sort of percentage increase in, does happen, how should, how do you expect that organizations like the IAEA should, ex, should expand alongside that? Would the IAEA need to remain about the same size? Would they need to put on more staff? Would, what would that exactly look like? Yeah, so you, you, I think one thing we need to realize is that the agency uh, is not self-funded. Right. It's based on, you know, uh, money that's provided by different states. So uh, one of the good news is that the U.S. provides about 25% of the budget. But the bad news is they basically have been zero growth now for probably a decade at least. And, uh, and that, in fact, so there's, there's a good news story of that, about that, and that is that it's forced them to think really hard and long on how to be efficient and focus their resources where it's most important and relax those resources where it's not as important. This is the idea of looking at the, the entire fuel cycle and assessing the state. They actually do what they call an acquisition pathway analysis for trying to get a weapon. And that, that really crazy diagram I had up there which showed the two pathways, enrichment versus reprocessing, is part of that assessment. However, um, yeah, we, we're certainly at least, would, would, we've already seen 60 reactors right now are being built. China's going to build tons of reactors. Um, they've actually built their pebble bed reactor is sized for the steam supply of their coal plants. So clearly they thought this through in terms of how they might use a pebble bed. Pebble bed reactors are quite interesting. It's a moving core. The pebbles uh, have uranium in them. They're about the size of tennis balls. But you can imagine from a safeguard standpoint, that's pretty interesting. It's a core that, that constantly changes all the time. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that you can reach a point, even though I, I'll argue with you that reactors are one of the easiest things to safeguard right now, and I mean traditional reactors. Molten salt reactors, that would be probably a different story, um, at least in terms of they actually did online kind of reprocessing and putting materials in there. But if you look at the current reactors, they're not hard to safeguard. But obviously, if the numbers get large enough, you reach a breaking point at the IEA. So the world's really going to have to figure this one out uh, in terms of how much they're willing to spend. There is this um, conflict uh, within the IEA, because the IEA does two things. We are talking about the Department of Safeguards right now. That's really kind of what I'm talking about in terms of nonproliferation, the nonproliferation treaty, the different agreements, the measurements, and so forth. But they also promote nuclear energy. So they also have technical assistance programs. And if you talk to the states that want those technical assistance programs, they'll argue that you should take more of the money away from the Department of Safeguards and help us expand our nuclear capacity, whatever it might be, cancer research, studying groundwater, building reactors, or whatever. Um, but yeah, there can be, even though reactors aren't hard, I think eventually there is a breaking point where it'll be very difficult for the agency to carry out even simple tasks because they're so understaffed. 250 people right now for the entire world, and there are hundreds of facilities. All right. I'd like to add just a piece onto that from the U.S. perspective. Um, we, we often talk about the international perspective of expanding nuclear energy, but as you said, this expansion is probably going to happen, and it's going to happen in a lot of countries that don't already have nuclear power. And we have a lot of um, bilateral agreements around the world, um, the U.S. with other countries, in order to export nuclear technology. And we don't have those agreements currently with new nuclear countries, many of them. So the, the 
there's one side, which is the non-proliferation angle, but we also have a lot of non-proliferation leverage if the U.S. is the country exporting to these nuclear newcomer countries. So that is a lot of the policies that we're pushing for in the advanced nuclear space is to streamline some of these export control policies so that the U.S. can be exporting to these new nuclear countries and therefore have that leverage in that country to be the owners of that nuclear technology rather than other countries like Russia or China. Sure. There's actually a really good point here. Okay. If you use U.S. uranium, you have to get permission from the U.S. on how you use that uranium. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the good news. It fits into what Lincoln just said. The bad news is that some countries have felt that the U.S. has been restricting their ability to use nuclear, different nuclear processes. They're reducing their purchases of U.S. uranium to get away from that legal hurdle. Okay. More questions? Uh, uh, oh, Facebook one first. Sure. Uh, another one. This one uh, maybe for Lanka. Um, what is the number one thing current nuclear professionals can do to have a positive effect on public opinion and governmental influences? Talk to people. Get out of your laboratory and your company and just talk to people. <laughs> and tell your personal story. Right behind John. So uh, I guess it's a question for the panel, but uh, in particular for our members that may have memories of the Carter administration and onward. Um, just a lot of the current nuclear regulations from the NRC, things about like void coefficients, breeding, that sort of thing, do they really make sense for a modern nuclear fleet? Do they actually have a place in keeping us safe? Or at this point, are they just red tape that new blood needs to flush out? Should I take that one? Okay. So I can talk a little bit about our NRC experience. Um, the, we, we, we're currently going through the NRC licensing process and um, the regulations as they're written were written for large light water reactors. Um, ours is much different. The module itself, so the reactor vessel itself, is the containment, um, which is much different from traditional large light water reactors. We don't have pumps, so therefore we don't need safety systems for pumps. Um, and the regulations are very prescriptive. So if you have this component, then you need a safety system for this component. Um, and we just simply don't have that component. So we're trying to help the NRC um, change a lot, not change a lot of re its regulations because we basically apply for exceptions to rules, but there definitely could be a better way of going about it and doing more of a risk informed approach. And that's definitely going to be needed for um, being able to license uh, more advanced nuclear reactors. We yeah. have learned something in the last 40 years, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Let me chime in there a little bit too because the regulator often gets, a lot of people in, in advanced nuclear say, oh, the regulator is holding us back and we have to change all the regulation before we can get going. But uh, I, I want to, and there's some, there's a little bit of truth to that, but there's a lot of uh, truth to, there's a lot of other things that are in the way as well like engineering and technological development. A lot of these things take a long time to develop. If you have a new advanced fuel, uh, you can design it and run simulations on it and think it'll work fine, but then you have to test it in a test reactor, and this can take a very long time. Uh, and there's a bunch of Admiral Rickover quotes um, that if you want to go to WikiQuote or whatever, he has lots to say about it, and he's really right. The more I've been in advanced nuclear, the more I've realized that some of the stuff this guy who really built the nuclear navy, really had it figured out. You spend a lot of time on sort of seemingly trivial engineering developments, and uh, that doesn't necessarily have to do with the regulator, it has to do with the technology. So uh, if you think you're gonna get in there and build a new, brand new kind of reactor real quick, uh, it's, you've got a lot of work to do. Eric, you wanna go? Sure. Um, better the mic for the, no, the audio. Uh, so one one of the objections that's uh, a lot at nuclear often, um, and I'm thinking of California in particular, is that it's not flexible enough. That base load is a, is a bad thing um, because it can't ramp up and down. Um, so maybe we can speak a little bit about the ability of the current fleet to ramp up and down, and then like uh, I know that's a huge softball for your technology, so you can <laughs> you can hop on the the end of that question. 
<laughs> yeah, the new the, the, the new reactors can ramp up and down completely. So, but the existing fleet can ramp up and down easily 10 percent. But for a big reactor, that's a huge amount of power. Um, now, now in, in the Pacific Northwest, we use hydro because that's the easiest thing to ramp up and down. And so, whenever wind comes on, it, it always displaces hydro, which is a kind of a horrible thing because you're one renewal is displacing another one. It's supposed to be dis displacing fossil fuel, which in the Pacific Northwest is not. So, so that, that that's kind of a problem. But but, but the, the the existing fleet can ramp up, you know, and down pretty reasonably. But there's no reason to do that uh, because they, you either have hydro or gas or, or or something else. So if you're getting rid of those, though. Um, then, then, then the new fleet will, will be able to ramp up and down. I mean, th there's no reason to use big nuclear to, to ramp up and down. There, there just isn't any reason to do that. It, it, it's the best baseload um, source. So. I have a question Len Lenka wants to make one more point. Quickly show, um, we, we've actually done a study on this on the new scale module being able to load follow with a wind farm. Um, this is the typical output per day of the Horse Butte wind farm, which is in Idaho. See that with the blue line. Um, and then with our simulator, um, which uh, models the plant completely, we were able to load follow that on um, the order of a few minutes. So, and that's the orange line to load follow typical demand per day. Now the problem with load following with nuclear is that you're not saving that much economically because the fuel cost is so low and the total operational cost that you're even when you're when you're not putting electricity online you're not making money and you're not saving much money either so our our idea is to really use the heat um, the power from the module to do something else like produce hydrogen when you don't need it for electricity and that's when it'll become really economic yeah that's a really great idea you just transfer the heat the constant heat you switch from electricity and then you start making uh you can desalinate water or make hydrogen or make uh, other hydrocarbons and then you just shift it to whatever you want based on the load. That's a, I really like that. Idea. I, I had a follow-up for that. Are, yeah. are we actually saving anything in Washington State when we switch to hydro? I had heard previously that we, we don't have that many reservoir dams. For instance, uh, it's lot. saving what? When saving, what? Saving, saving energy, saving switching to a different technology, like when the wind or the sun comes up and we stand down our hydro resources, are we, are no. we actually... We're not. We're not. Um, so, so when 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 that happens, you have to spill water o over the top of the dam, which is one wasting water, and and it increases the the dissolved nitrogen in the water, which is actually bad for fish. So it's not a really great thing to do. We don't do it much because renewables are not very very large yet. But if they come into 10, 20, 30 percent, then you have some some real problems. Um, there was a question up there, and someone's been trying for. All right, let's get him. Uh, this is a question for Nick. Um, I was wondering if there are any significant disadvantages to breeder reactors for civilian power generation, and also why um, uh, why weren't they used before? Why is this only becoming a thing today? Okay, great question. So they were attempted to be used before. In from the actually when reactors first became a thing, all the scientists thought they the only way to make commercial power was with breeder reactors because they thought uranium was extremely scarce. And so they started developing breeder reactors. The first one turned out in like 1953 or something. EBR-1 uh, lit up a town in Idaho. Uh, however, it turned out uranium was much more plentiful than people thought. And it was very cheap to just mine uranium, enrich it, and run it in traditional reactors. But the, there was a big program that went through into the late 70s. And we had a big pro prototype reactor called the Clinch River Breeder Reactor that we spent a lot of money on, the US government did, and it eventually got canceled by uh, first Jimmy Carter and finally by Reagan. Um, and then we had some other reactors that were still on that were fast reactors, um, early generation ones, but they got canceled in the 90s by uh, Clinton, basically because nuclear wasn't popular, they were trying to cut costs, and there it went. So we have tried it before, and we basically haven't succeeded because they were just more expensive than the light water reactors that were already up and running thanks to the Navy. And so there was just no incentive to go to them. Why, why do something different when you, of course, when you ramp all the way up, then you need the, when you have a huge fleet, you need better safety and you need uh, the better fuel utilization. There are, so cost is one major disadvantage. We haven't been able to commercialize them cheaper than light water reactors. Russia is currently the only uh, country in the world that has is successfully operating a commercial fast reactor. 
Um, other disadvantages, so, I mean, you have this great coolant, but it's sodium, which, in, at least in our case, the sodium, when you have a sodium coolant, it does react with air and water, so you have to keep air and water out. And you get these sodium fires that, uh, we now have 400 reactor years of operation with sodium coolant, and sodium fires are an operational occurrence that we design for. We expect them, there's going to be a leak, and we know how to deal with it. <laughs> I have to be fair. <laughs> So, so, anyway, I'm going to stop. So, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people think, you know, how can we influence the public or science enthusiasts to get into nuclear power? Um, but my question is, how can we influence organizations that are opinion leaders, like, say, the Union for Concerned Scientists, who are kind of a go-to for a lot of um, left-leaning pundits, like when John Oliver did his story on nuclear power, he essentially did no proper research. Because the Union of Concerned Scientists is, like I said, a kind of a flagship for left-leaning political causes, which leads them to being correct on, say, glyphosate or GMOs or nuclear power. But how can we talk to them and convince them to change their stance? That's something um, I'm not sure how to do. Yeah, so. We've but, tried. We've tried and tried and tried. But it's actually in their charter to be anti-nuclear, so it's kind of hard to, to get them to change. <laughs> I like them in general. But in this instance, they're, they're really ridiculous. But yeah. that's okay. The, the, and I love John Oliver, but he was wrong on that one. Yeah. One of the co found the co founder of Greenpeace came out as pro nuclear, and he got ostracized from his organization, as you probably know, Patrick Moore. Um, one and thing Jim Hansen has been ostracized. Right. So, one, one thing that I've found, I don't know if it's actually working, but there's these climate scientists like Jim Hansen, who's this you know, the environmentalist superhero who's leading the charge on climate change. And he's, and Stuart Brand, uh, who's also out there, these, these famous, uh, well-known environmentalists, and they're coming out with these extraordinarily pro-nuclear uh, uh, messages. And they're coming not from the nuclear industry, but from the environmentalist industry or the, the climate scientists. Or and, and that, I think, I feel like that's really effective. I don't have any data on if it's actually working. Greenpeace is still very anti. but. It seems like that's the kind of thing that really, if you can convince those kind of thought leaders, and then they are much more, the public believes them much more. I think that we still need to get out there as engineers or people that support nuclear um, to go to the conferences that these people go to. Um, you'll find that in a lot of these organizations, including the Union of Concerned Scientists, I've had meetings with them, people within the organizations do support nuclear or a lot of them just simply have questions about nuclear, and I've never met a nuclear engineer to ask those questions to. So get out of the nuclear, pro-nuclear echo chamber and go to the other side and try to talk to people. And, and it might take a generational shift, and frankly, we don't have that time, but we can be doing some of the work now to prep for that. Yeah. All right, another question? Please. Yeah, I have a question about the waste. It was alluded to and is written on this poster. Used nuclear fuel presents no environmental threat. Absolutely. Slide 10. <laughs> it, it, it depends on what waste you're talking If you're talking about weapons waste, yeah, that, that, that's the issue. I mean, the weapons waste is the issue, but spent fuel is a piece of cake. It doesn't leak. It's easy to deal with. Um, most people don't realize we have a deep, un, uh, deep geologic underground nuclear waste repository, do you know that? It's in New Mexico, okay? No one knows about it much. It's been operating since 1999, um, and, and this is part of it. Uh, if you want to go down there, let me know. Um, so there, <laughs> this, this guy standing there, okay, this, the, he's, he's standing in front of nuclear waste. The really hot stuff is in the wall, which, which is robotically dug out and robotically inserted, the really, the really hot waste hotter than in, in anything left at Hanford, which is kind of interesting. And then the, the, the bomb waste that he's standing in front of is you know, plutonium uranium, so it's just alpha, so just a, a simple quarter inch steel drum is good enough. But he's getting a tenth of the, of the radiation dose that we're getting sitting right here. Because he's a half mile below the earth, that's pure salt, okay? So it's massive salt, which takes water about a billion years to move an inch. That's when you want the right rock. We've known about this forever. 1957, the National Academy of Sciences chose this salt as the best place to put nuclear waste. This repository was designed for all nuclear waste of any type. It was simply permitted and licensed only for transuranic, that really weird green blob in that earlier slide. Um, so again, we, we know how to do this. It's easy, it's cheap. If it's in the right rock, if it's in the wrong rock, it's very expensive, very difficult. Um, and so you really need to back up and, and actually ask the 
people that know how to do this, what should we do? I mean, the best, you know, the best geologists in Congress have come up with our present program. It's supposed to get a laugh too, but, uh, but, 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 but we know that. So again, the, the, the politics about this issue is extraordinary, and it's gotten worse since, since 1976 when it really became political. Before that, it wasn't very, very political. We didn't have much nuclear waste, and so we actually knew what to do with it. Scientists said, yep, this is what we do with it. Um, piece of cake, and then we got derailed in the 1970s because we came up with this idea that we were going to actually retrieve this waste sometime in the future because we made a bad decision and disposed of it. So, 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 so the idea that, that now you're, you're, you, know, you need a 50-year retrievability window, that's kind of a screen door in a submarine, it's kind of a dumb idea because you compromise your permanence. You want a permanent, deep geologic repository forever and ever and ever. Um, and that's this repository, so it's great. Or I mean, we have lots of salt in the United States. It's perfect. This is this one's about 2,000 feet thick. Uh, it's a half mile below the earth. It's perfect. No, no, it's easy. Now, if you go someplace else, it's weird and difficult and hard. Yeah, it becomes expensive and difficult and hard. Um, but uh, if you just want to step back and do what's scientifically correct, it's easy. Thanks. I gave you extra time for that. Ah, excellent. Great answer. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I mean, even though, for example, Yucca Mountain has been basically stopped in this country, by the way, nearby there are 800 nuclear explosives that were done underground in that same area, so it's a pretty nice place to do it. But Finland is, in fact, going to open the first deep geological repository for spent fuel in 2020, I think is what their target is right now. So my interest in that is also the IE's interest in that is uh, because of all the plutonium in there, you know, what will the IEA do? So um, it's a cooperative venture. The IEA has already done 3D laser mapping of this repository that they developed. They've looked at how they would measure the spent fuel before it gets encapsulated in a container, which just happens to be copper. They also are looking at technologies like eddy current and ultrasonic to look at the weld so they can determine whether a container was opened again and maybe resealed. And they're even looking at having seismic sensors to make sure somebody isn't drilling in from another area. So that's kind of the crazy safeguards perspective of who might go in there and try to steal it. So they are actually thinking and working on that, and they're working hand in hand with uh, with Finland. Uh, and I don't, you know, see that there'll be any problem. And the Finns will be way ahead of everybody else in putting it where it belongs. You know, nuclear waste is not something you can back a pickup truck to, you know, up to and then throw in the back and drive away. I mean, this stuff is heavy. I mean, it's really, really heavy. So, you know, you need an entire operation to, to deal with it. So no one's going to steal that. Now, you may steal something else before it gets to that point. Who else? Yeah, right there. Uh, so my question goes to you and Mike. Uh, um, okay. Sorry. I imagine that for many utilities in Western Europe and the United States, nuclear investment must look kind of like a poison chalice when you look at all of these uh, uh, activities that have gone way over schedule and over budget. What do you think it's gonna take for the nuclear industry to reestablish a reliable track record? And is that really feasible uh, in a politically and economically liberalized system? Or is that going to require, I guess, market changes in market structure and incentives or uh, is nuclear going to only really see expansion in uh, countries other than the U.S., for instance? Well, let me start, and I'll set you up, Lenka. <laughs> um, so one thing that people have studied the cost overruns in nuclear plants, and one thing that is pretty interesting to me is that the South Koreans are really consistent in building things pretty much on schedule and on budget. And what they've done is they've standardized one design. It's not the latest and greatest design, it's just one design, and they have a team of people who have gone and built it, the same one, I mean the same design, again and again and again. It's just, they, they figured it out. They know, they worked all the kinks out of it, and they just go around, and they know how to do it, they have the whole supply chain, and off they go. And so this ability to iterate on a standard design, I think, is really key uh, to the nuclear industry getting its cost down. I mean, we know if we keep going two or three times over budget, you know, people just you're not, that's not a great business thing. So we, we know we need to do that. And, and the way you can do that with a more advanced reactors to start small. Take it away. That's us. <laughs> I think 
what we're doing differently is again we're doing that standard design we're building it in a factory so that keeps um, the construction risk low because we're doing we're building the nuclear parts of the reactor inside of a factory that's dedicated to um, building those modules and then constructing the site at the same time so you have construction going on at the same time that you're manufacturing the modules um, now with the Westinghouse situation they were trying to reinvigorate an industry a supply chain in the US that has been dormant for the last um, couple three two or three decades so they've suffered from that and trying to um, reinvigorate this industry so we as new scale and being another plant to be built in the U.S. in the mid-2020s um, will benefit from um, the lessons learned from Westinghouse and from them trying to reinvigorate the industry. I think it's also important to remember that as New Scale, if we don't succeed with our first plant, then I mean, that is what our company is. We don't have other revenue streams. We don't have other services that we're providing. So it's really important to us to have a successful um, first plant to be built on budget and on time. And I think what it'll take to reinvigorate the industry in the US is a success story. And we hope to be that success story. Anyone else? Well, there's eight minutes left. Someone must have a... <laughs> well, uh, if not, oh, yeah. I, I could give people info about the recording. Info about the recording? Sure. I mean, so you, you recorded it? Yeah, so the Friends of Fission Facebook site is going to have a link to my YouTube, uh, SoundCloud, and uh, if I can get them from Gene, the slides. Excellent. Uh, and there's, oh, I, I've... I don't think we have this slide, but there's a book about all these topics um, called Seeing the Light that's written by a UW professor who couldn't be here today. Um, I had a, anyway, it's on Amazon, Seeing the Light, and it basically covers all the stuff we're talking about pretty generally. It's all about nuclear for climate change, so if you want to read more there's about a, it. There's a slide on that. There was a, yeah, do we have it? Um, well, it was, it's, it's on the other deck. Yeah. So, Scott uh, Montgomery and Tom Scram. Right. So Scott Montgomery has been on panels with us before, but is I think he's in the UK right now giving a talk uh, on the same topic, but in the UK. So, thanks. Um, and so to sing us out, I think Eric might be able to provide us. <laughs> so thank you all for your time. Uh, I hope you learned something tonight, and I really appreciate you coming. Good stuff. The, la the last time I did this was in Finland. It's great, great fun. They had a super swell de decarbonization conference there last month. Um, Finland is making moves on nuclear right now. Um, thanks. Uh, okay, I'm going to get this. this out. Oh, sorry. No, that's all right. I got a card. So you were a professional opera singer. Uh, yeah, I uh, gigged with the Minnesota Opera, and uh, I sang on uh, A Prairie Home Companion with Garrison Keillor. Um, <laughs> great, good fun. Um, you could probably tell I'm from Minnesota. It's, I know, it's got the draw. Okay, so here you go. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Feel free to stick around and talk to any of us. Or, uh, but thank you. Appreciate it. Especially if you're interested in getting involved with making events like this happen or even just learning more.